others are joining us now. Uh, we had some technical difficulties with uh, some new computers and some PowerPoint and all the things uh, that should make me super nervous, but because of the fundamentals I'm going to teach you tonight, if you haven't heard before, uh, this is why I'm not, uh, I'm not worried about this at all. So thanks for joining us tonight to talk about how to lose your fear of public speaking and of giving pitches or, or any small group talk or presentation. Uh, We've all heard the stories about how people uh, fear public speaking more than they fear death. Uh, I think uh, one guy said to me, uh, uh, he fears snakes uh, more than public speaking, but uh, uh, they're right up there with uh, fear of public speaking and rats. But, uh, the thing is, we speak in public all the time, and uh, we just don't realize we're doing it. We talk to our friends, fellow workers at the office or on the job site all the time. We speak to groups of friends and uh, relatives at weddings, anniversaries, funerals, but yet we worry about talking to a bunch of strangers from a desk or a podium. While I was preparing for this course, I consulted a number of books on the subject. There's lots of books about how to write soaring speeches that will be remembered for decades to come. Uh, but this course isn't about that. This course is about presenting, getting rid of your fear of presenting any kind of a public meeting uh any kind of a public statement uh but it's not about this is about us those of us who talk maybe once or twice a year who may only speak in public once or twice a year for us uh for us public speaking is an unnatural act and uh, we avoid it as much as we can I believe uh, we can get over that fear with a handful of principles we'll talk about here tonight. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, I was a TV and radio reporter and a producer for more than 40 years. I'm still a media consultant, a freelance journalist. And if you go to the occasional uh, Tim Hortons, I'm a raconteur. Uh, but still, I get nervous uh, when I give a speech or public presentation. Back when, in the old days, when we used to, um, when we used to speak in public and not on Zoom, uh, a lot of my examples of fear of public speaking come from my career as a TV and radio reporter. So. In a way, this course is about 40 years in the making. So let's talk about how to reduce stress. We've only got a, about 40 minutes to get this all in, uh, and then we'll, I'll take some questions. But uh, let's talk about how to reduce the stress and become, if not great public speakers, good public speakers, because uh, this is an aim that, uh, being some you know big time politician or something like that you just want to get the fundamentals about how you can overcome your fear of public speaking because it's nothing to fear uh first to make us feel better let's talk about famous people who had trouble speaking in public the great actor sir Lawrence lawrence olivier allegedly got stage fright at age 60 after being you know he was a top british actor for years and years and he told other actors not to look him in the eye on stage for six years i'm not sure i buy this uh the guy if you saw his movies and you saw his shakespearean plays many of whom many of them were on film 
it's hard to believe that he had stage fright, but I guess it's possible because they call it glossophobia. It's fear of social interaction and fear of public speaking. So another one that I'm not so sure I buy into, another example is uh, Fidel Castro, uh, the late dictator of Cuba from 59 to just recently. Uh, I'm not sure I buy that either. He may, uh, he used to speak for six hours at a time and, you know, he was a dictator. I mean, if you got up to leave one of his speeches, they'd have you killed probably. So I, I don't think many people uh, walked out on him and he may have had stage fright speaking English because I've seen documentaries of him going to the UN in 59 and 60 asking the US for help which they didn't give him. Uh, I'm not here to talk politics, but they didn't give him any help. And uh, he joined with uh, the Soviet Union after that. But uh, he spoke perfect English, but he, he may have had stage fright about that because I never heard him speak English again for the next probably 60 years. Uh, so, so how can we be confident in any speaking situation? The first title, which is preparation, prepare and know your audience. A lot of speakers start with a joke. In fact, uh, a really well-known speaker in, in uh, rotary circles here in Windsor, uh, he, uh, he mentioned to me, you should start with a joke. But uh, when you're talking about jokes you should know your audience and one and be very careful make sure the joke's appropriate uh, one example i was once booed off the stage at uh, the old blue bonnet hotel in in tilbury just before i went on stage a farmer he pulled me aside it was a farmer's meeting i was speaking at and they and he said uh, he told me this joke. He said, uh, how do you stop a whining dog and a whining farmer on your front porch? And the punchline is you let the dog in. Now I, I got booed <laughs> vociferously by the farmers that were in the meeting that day. It was a convention of the Kent Federation of Agriculture. And it was really stupid of me to do that because uh, we were in our, I think it was in the, the 82 recession, a lot of farmers were losing their farms and uh, losing their mortgages and uh, they weren't in a very jovial mood and I didn't read the audience uh, and I, that was kind of dumb. I won them back by the end of the, the talk by saying that uh, there were 2,200 Kent County farmers at the time, and I promised I would try to talk to every one of them on, uh, on television. So I got some applause for that, but it was a really dumb thing to say. And it was uh, this, the worst case I've ever witnessed. I was at a meeting, a Christmas party at the, if you're, you're from Windsor, you, you remember the old uh, Lakewood golf course and their, you know, their big uh, clubhouse. They used to have a lot of Christmas parties there. I was there for the heavy construction and developers uh, meeting. And it was a Christmas party. Everybody was there with their wives and children and everybody was having a good time and they had a nice Christmas dinner. And, and there were a lot of millionaire developers there at the time, home builders and construction millionaires. And the biggest one, I, I won't mention his name, but he was there with his 90 uh, year old mother. And he was the biggest builder in this area at the time. And uh, the comedian was from the US and he was used to a nightclub audience. And from the beginning, uh, he didn't really read the room. He came in, he started unleashing F-bombs and telling sex jokes. 
and mothers and fathers starting putting their hands over their kids ears and pulling their kids to the back doors of the hall and the big developer hurried his elderly mother out the door and it was a disaster and the guy did not know his audience he did not read the room and quite frankly he didn't really care they had to uh, pull him off the stage because he wanted to get paid for the night i think he did get paid for the night but it was a very short uh nightclub act he used at the time so the first way to reduce nervousness is to take attention off yourself see because that's why you're all worried about what people are going to think of you you take the attention off yourself and concentrate on the audience and how you can serve them. Uh, your attitude should be 90% audience and 10% you. And what you can do for the audience. And the way to find out is you need to find out what they want. It doesn't take a great deal of research. It, it, it has... It can be a small group or it can be, uh, you know, you could be making a sales pitch to 20 people, you know, selling a product or selling a service. Uh, and, you know, you're nervous. You know, I've been in that situation and, uh, you know, I was probably shaking under the, the table, but I could contain myself uh, and, the way to find if like say you're talking in a big ballroom situation uh one one friend of mine tells me he he will stand at the door of a ballroom where there's a convention or a big meeting of a certain group of professionals and he'll introduce my, himself to them say hi i'm joe schmo i'm here to speak and i'm wondering what you're interested in in you know this is the topic i've got from the organizers what what can i do to enhance this topic for you and so that means you have to get out there and the more you're talking to other people the more you're thinking less about how this is going to go because you get to know the crowd in a way you get get a few names and then during the speech, you can say, well, as Joe told me uh, out in the hallway or as Judy told me, you know, they're interested in this. And it gets the audience uh, involved in the speech right away. And it gets you involved with the audience. You can, you can see these people in the crowd. You now have a couple of friends in the crowd. And, uh, you know, this could happen anywhere. Like I said, a small meeting, a rotary club, you know, usually the audience is there. They're pulling for you. They want you to do well. And, uh, but once again, the key is thinking about what they want. And it takes the focus off of you. And it's uh, how, how you're going to, you'll feel better that way. You'll feel more confident. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can do the research. Sometimes, uh you know you can talk to the organizers they'll give you the topic they want you to talk about but dealing with people and feeling more confident that way uh, it helps a lot now uh, before we move on to the next topic i've decided i was going to save relaxation exercises for the end of the uh, the talk but i think i'm going to weave them during the talk in case people are especially tonight where we don't know how often people are going to or at what time they're going to get in uh to the um to the talk tonight this may uh, this would be taped as well so i think it you'll be able to see it again so here's the first exercise this is the one that's in every book about public speaking, it's called deep breathing. And the latest thing I saw was uh, taking three deep breaths before you speak backstage. And that's seven seconds in, seven seconds out. So do it with me right now.
So that's the first exercise where there's gonna be four or five of these I'll share with you, but that's the first one and use a cheat sheet. So here's the point, you write, you still write your speech and you, you write it. Uh, this is the one part uh, Amanda Gelman and I do a seminar. We teach people how to do this, uh, like politicians and CEOs and, and people who write, you know, to write news releases, write speeches when they're going to hold news conferences. But that's an all day seminar. We won't do that here. Uh, but, you know, the basics is, or the basics are. <laughs> This is great because the next line is use good grammar and uh, use small words and short sentences, write the way you would speak. And that's, that's why you don't, uh, you don't memorize it. So that's the only assumption I'm going to make for this talk is that you have a speech you want to present it and you want to lose that fear of presenting the speech, whether it's two minutes or two hours, uh, it's the same principle. Now, uh, the best way to, uh, to talk to the audience is like the way you would talk to your friends and family, like we're talking right now, just uh, be casual and when I say don't memorize or don't memorize, uh, use a cheat sheet. Uh, it's because you're not, first of all, you're not going to remember most people, unless you've got a photographic memory, you're not going to remember every line of every speech, no matter how much you work on it, how many times you try to memorize it. I'll, I'll give you a personal example. When I was uh, just started TV reporting, I tried to avoid live uh, appearances on TV as much as possible. I always wanted to be on film or on tape. So everything was perfect because I was scared to death to go on. I was thinking of the thousands of people out there who would be watching and, but, uh, when I worked at CBC, they insisted you have to go on live, memorize, you know, 15 seconds. They called it a, a beginning, like a top, uh, an intro. Then you go to a tape part of the story and then you go to a closer. Well, I'd be scared to death. I was just shaking. And what happened was I, I would try to memorize. I couldn't even memorize 10 seconds. You know, it was hard to say my own name at times. I was so afraid of being on TV. And the anchors look so calm because they got teleprompters in front of the camera. So they're reading the script, their scripts in front of the, the camera that they're looking at you, as we used to say, looking down the gun. And, uh, I'd freeze I, as soon as I got a word wrong. And it limited my career for a long time because producers uh, didn't trust me. They thought he's gonna freeze up on camera because what they do is when I froze or I lost my place, they would uh, just roll the tape. And it was quite embarrassing. And it, uh, it was career limiting at the time. And after 30 years, of doing it. I, I eventually got better at it through practice, which I'll talk about next. But uh, I found I, I'd hire, I hired a, a drama teacher. I took a drama course at the University of Windsor and that didn't help. I, um, I hired a drama teacher from the University of Toronto. He brought a camera and uh, he would tape me speaking and he, he talked about chunking words, you know, so you can memorize big chunks of words from your speeches and your scripts. And it still didn't work. And then a, a CBC trainer finally came up with a, a, a way to, well, sort of cheat to keep the, uh, um, 
keep all the points together without memorizing everything. And this, this was eye-opening for me. This was just the best thing. And uh, now it's in every course you can take uh, about uh, uh, public speaking. It's called a cheat sheet. And I got one right here that I'm using tonight. And it's, uh, it's just all the points of what I'm speaking about tonight. You know, one word points with uh, numbers. It's a list of, of everything I'm talking about right now, because I'm not going to read you the whole uh, script I wrote, even though I've been through the script and we'll talk about that in practice. Uh, but it gives you a bunch of key phrases, uh, one word things, this and one trainer says, you can put this all around the room. If you've got a, a mic, like a wireless mic on, and you can walk around the room you're uh, speaking at, you're not bound to the podium or the front desk you're sitting at. You can put one in the corner. You could put one at the back of the hall and you can impress the heck out of people because you're not carrying a script. You're it's on a ta it's on the other end of the table or it's uh, at the back of the room and you're speaking it's just a quick trick but it's called a cheat sheet and it's just key phrases you know names everything i've been talking about so far it's on this so that's one way to do it i had it written out i had trouble trouble with my printer today so i had it written out uh, uh, in longhand before too, but uh, that I've been preparing for this for you know a couple of weeks, so uh, I know everything we're talking about tonight. So I, uh, the cheat sheet is a big help, and I suggest it. I, it only took me about thirty years to adapt it, but better late than never. And. Uh, unless you're a bureaucrat or a politician who, uh, you know, or a lawyer or, or somebody, you know, a public official that has to read every word of the script because it's been lawyered by a bunch of lawyers. And if you speak out a turn, you're going to get sued for libel and slander, that kind of thing. Uh, I suggest the cheat sheet because it forces you First of all, to relax, and secondly, to talk out uh, the subject. So once you research your audience and you've uh, you've written out a cheat sheet, so you still have to practice. So start out with with your uh, your speech and read it like read it. Uh, you know, for two or three times till you're familiar with all the material you're going to talk about. And, uh, and practice it. But, but I just told you to use a cheat sheet. So it's not to memorize it. It's just to become familiar with everything you're going to be talking about. And I have a story to go with this from back in 1983. I had the opportunity to talk to Dan Rather. He had just taken over as the anchor of the CBS Evening News. I promise I won't drop any more names after this. But uh, Dan was speaking at the opening meeting of the 1983 season of the uh, Detroit Economic Club over at the Rensen and the then uh, uh, Weston Hotel, the original hotel that was in the Rensen when it opened. And he gave an, because there was a lot of demand for him to do interviews, he just decided to have a news conference before he spoke before the Detroit Economic Club. So he, uh, he had the news conference and we talked, you know, he talked to all the reporters about different things that were going on, how, how it was taking over from Walter Cronkite a couple years before, that kind of thing. 
And then when all the, then it was time for the, the cameramen and the reporters to break down their equipment, take it out into the ballroom at the West End to set up for Dan Rather's speech. Well, Dan Rather and I, Dan Rather and I got caught behind the door. Uh, we couldn't get out. All these uh, reporters were pushing past us and uh, they, <laughs> so i'm talking to him then and i had i had written a fan letter to him when i was in university during the 76 election night when jimmy carter became the president of the united states it didn't happen until about three in the morning and i wrote a letter to him at cbs saying i'm just a journalism student but i want to thank you for keeping my attention till three in the morning because of all your stories and all the, you know, it was a lot of down home Texasisms, you know, yellow dog Democrats and stuff like that. But uh, uh, he wrote me back and he said, uh, it was just two lines. I uh, was, uh, uh, thank you for your kind words. I love what I do. And that really inspired me. That was a big deal to get a letter from him in journalism school. He's still working. He's working. He's, I think he just turned 90 years old. He's on AXS or AXS cable, Mark Cuban's cable station, interviewing rock stars and country and Western stars. It's kind of funny to see him uh, you know, interviewing Led Zeppelin, that kind of stuff. It's quite a contrast, Dan Rather interviewing rock stars, but some of them are almost as old as him. Uh, but, but he said, uh, so I asked him when we were behind the door, I said, I said, can I ask you something about how you read the, the news? I said, uh, you know, six hours, you know, how many times do you read your script you know and of course he had a, has a tele he had a teleprompter then to read the news half hour news show he said he read his scripts six times no script was on that newscast unless he had read read it six times unless it was, of course it was breaking news now here's a guy who had been doing it by then, you know, he covered the Kennedy assassination in 63. This is 1983. So he'd been doing this since his days in Texas back in the earlier 60s. So for more than 20 years, he still read his script over six times, even if he had the teleprompter. But he said that because he needed to be familiar with the story, even if the teleprompter broke down. Now, here, I think uh, the best part uh, of new technology now is, uh, and this comes under the practice theme, you got a cell phone. Most people have cell phones now. You can write your script, write your, your uh, cheat sheet, and you can practice it. You can practice it over as many times as you like in the privacy of your own home. And uh, I think this, this is the most exciting part of public speaking now, that, that all you need is a cell phone or an iPhone, or even you can record on uh, laptops. But this this has to be the greatest innovation I can think of. I, I uh, you know I I invested in uh, uh, you know like a camcorder years ago, and I thought you know like I paid like three hundred dollars for it. And thought it was a major investment. I've used it two or three times. And cell phones cell phones provide everything I need in terms of uh, taking videos and and practicing and it's an amazing thing now if you're not used to speaking and recording your voice and your face you you know 
it may come as a shock to you the first time you look at it, but uh, you do it enough, you practice enough, uh, you'll get used to it. It's like uh, learning how to ride a bike, I guess, is the best analogy. Uh, you'll get used to it and you'll get better at it. And hence, you'll, you'll feel more relaxed. And when I say that now, uh, let's go to a second exercise to relax for public speaking. And this is one I saw on PBS on a, a brain health show. And it said, you should cross your arms before you, in this case, before you speak and rub your arms like this. And it does two things. It calms you down by doing something physical. Now, I don't suggest you do this when you're speaking, but this is good just before you speak, when you got butterflies in your stomach. And apparently, it in, like the, uh, the deep breathing brings oxygen to your brain, this causes your brain, both sides of your brain to engage because you're using your right side as, you know, all about that. Your right side is run by the left side of your brain and the left side is run by the right side of your brain. So uh, this engages both sides of your brain and it's a calming effect. This is what psychologists are saying about that. So that's a, that's a second tip. See, I, I don't have any uh, videotape to show you of massive meltdowns on stage. So this will uh, substitute for that, show you how to relax. That's another exercise. Uh, but the uh, the other thing to do with the cell phone, though, getting back to the cell phone, is once you've done it a couple of times, you can you can uh, email it to somebody or text it to somebody you trust to get their opinion, and then they maybe they they'll be able to give you some tips on what you, what it needs. People you trust, people who will be uh, professional and you know, let's say kind about it. Uh, so, so that leads us to the next topic. We're getting near the end, uh, focus. If after you've done your cheat sheet, you, you've, practice, you've read your, your speech several times, you become familiar enough to use your cheat sheet to speak into your phone or whatever video device you have, you may think, well, this is slow. This is really, uh, or it's too long. That means you need to refocus uh, your talk. And uh, this is uh, this is something Amanda and I teach in our uh, news conference and uh, media relations uh, seminar, and that is you should you should focus your your talk to three to five key points. I'm I'm really. Uh, stretching it here with five points, you'll notice by the time we're finished. But three to five points, and and the reason for that is, think of the number, the best speeches you've ever heard in your life. Uh, I think of John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. Ask not what you can do for your country. I can think of, and his birthday's coming up on Monday, Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. Now, think of any speech you've ever seen. Uh, you're lucky to think of one thing you remember, or somebody you saw recently, a, a prime minister, or a premier, or a politician you like. It's hard, you're hard pressed to remember. I, I'll bet you you're hard pressed to remember more than one idea that came from that talk, whether it was 20 minutes or uh, an hour long. Uh, if I can uh, make, make that suggestion, 
this this is probably one of the most important things in this talk. And uh, in journalism, we call it the magic of three. You'll notice that many TV stories, many even print stories, they limit things to three point, three key points. And politicians have glammed onto this, and they're, you know, to say uh, Justin Trudeau said today he's got a new plan for COVID. Uh, he outlined uh, 10, 10 ideas. Here are the top three. That's the kind of thing. Because journalists, TV journalists, especially know, and on the radio where they're, you're just listening and you're not reading it on TV, because a lot of times you got TV on in another room. You, you don't see all the points written out on the screen, but, but you hear you can remember three points. And, and I think that's something that if you can limit your talks to three to five points, uh, you, can, you can make sure people come away with the, at least one good idea that you've given. And, and something like when I do, when I do a, a talk about uh, news releases, and uh, sending notices to media outlets. I always say there's one thing I tell people to always remember, phone, phone the TV station, phone the newspaper, follow up your email to make sure people got it. Because nine times out of 10, it gets lost in a pile of 300 emails a day like I used to get at CBC. So, so that's my point. And the other thing about that is uh, try to match a story with every point. Uh, as I said, you know, what, what I've tried to do in this talk is I've uh, added a story to il illustrate every point because the worst thing you can do is just get a PowerPoint with all sorts of statistics and all sorts of numbers, all sorts of facts. Uh, people just don't say, stay tuned mentally to that. Uh, but, but if you stick to three to five points and you put a story at each point, uh, that'll help keep their att attention. Uh, because I think it's innate. You know, like when we were children, what did we say to our parents? Tell me a story. And, uh, you know, or, or you told them a story, a bedtime story, or the teacher read a story to you. You had story time in kindergarten, that kind of thing. I think uh, that's innate in us. We, we love people who tell us stories. Uh, I've never heard a kid say to me, tell me a statistic. Tell me uh, a list of, uh, you know, the populations of 12 nations in the United States, in the world. But they will say to you, tell me a story. Sometimes they'll have you tell the same story over and over again. That would have saved me a lot of time in the media. Uh, so I'll tell you one last story for me. Uh, at one time, I thought I was uh, going to give up journalism and become a preacher. So I went down to Texas and I, uh, I took a course down in the Bible Belt because I thought there was no place better to learn how to be an evangelist. And uh, I had high ideals. And uh, so I got down there, I was taking this course and this old preacher was teaching one of the courses. And I said, uh, tell me something. How do you know when you're doing a sermon how uh, the crowd is reacting to you because you know you're all there for a reason, any kind of church or mosque or synagogue or anywhere. How do you how do you know you've got their attention? And he said, "Well, when you when you've been talking for a while and people start coughing, uh, that's the time to wrap things up." So. 
or clearing their throat, that kind of thing. So I came back to Windsor. I, I told the elders at my church, I said, I want to, you know, I have these new skills teaching. Uh, I'd like to do a sermon at the church on Sunday. So I, <laughs> I, the time came, I got up on the behind the pulpit and the uh i start uh, you know i was all, all ready to preach you know i had all this great training down in texas and i i didn't get finished the first sentence i probably said hello uh good morning my name is and a guy in the first pew he started coughing <laughs> i went Oh, I'm dead. I'm dead. And then I kept talking and people kept coughing. Now, I don't know if everybody had a cold in the church that day or what it was, but that that was a sure sign to me that uh, I, I, I wasn't going to be a preacher. So I went back to TV and it was it went by pretty well. So now it's time to talk to you about uh, the last uh, thing, which is relaxation tips. I started, I, I, gave, I shared two with you, the breathing and crossing your arms. And uh, another, another course I consulted, it said, uh, before you go on to visualize Unlike my church story, visualize uh, you being successful. And even, you know, you can repeat over and over, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crush this speech. I'm going to be great. You know, as long as you believe it, it you're going to do it. Uh, and so to visualize. Now, uh, those of you who are watching from Windsor, uh, no, uh, uh, a former radio colleague of mine, Cam Gardner, died recently, and he he did me a big favor when I first started. He said, "See in your mind what you're talking about." So when you read the news, because he said you read the news like you're reading a shopping list, and I, the best critique I ever got. So he said, "Think about what you're talking about." I was on CKWW. I used to read the news on weekends, and they'd say, and he'd say, if it's a fire story, see the fire in your mind. If it's, uh, you know, uh, an earthquake in Haiti, see the earthquake, see the devastation. Think about what you're talking about. And you know, I I, I often say when I hear somebody just reading the words like I've tried not to do tonight. When people are just reading the words, I always say they know the words, but they don't know the music. So you got, so if you've got a sincere feeling, first of all, for your audience, and a sincere feeling of what words you're speaking, it's going to be a success and you're gonna feel better inside. So that's another thing. The other thing is to visualize a place uh, where you've been the most happy in your life. So this is before a speech. You want to feel calm. You want to feel peace. And the one I use, and once again, it's a Windsor reference. I grew up near Mitchell Park, at Giles between Dougal and, and Bruce. And I would play baseball there when I was about 12 years old. I remember a day, a specific day when I, we had just played about five Sandlot baseball games. You know, I'd hit 12 home runs in five games. You know, it, it didn't matter. It was just a bunch of kids playing in the park, not organized baseball or anything. And I remember I was exhausted, but it was a happy exhausted. And I'd lay down in uh, center field. And I remember looking up at the blue sky. Uh, this is a July day, blue sky, puffy clouds. And I remember thinking, 
I wish every day was like this. Now, I've learned since I should have moved to uh, San Diego, where like my life goal at one time was to be a weatherman in San Diego because it was 75 Fahrenheit, partly cloudy, 75 Fahrenheit, sunny practically every day. It didn't rain a lot before climate change, of course, but didn't rain a lot. So maybe I should have, should have moved to San Diego, but it would be pretty boring, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, especially when you come from here where you like the seasons. You know, even Florida has changes of seasons for all the snowbirds. So that's my, and uh, the, the two, two more small things. One, I can't show it to you, but it's not, it's not dirty. It's just twiddling your toes. Psychologists say, and a lot of the, the speech books say, you, should, you can twiddle your toes while you're, uh, while you're speaking. Uh, either standing or sitting uh, and that will take you back to when you were a child and you twiddled your toes and it helped you relax and then uh, a couple other things one more thing Yul Brenner uh, for those uh, my age and older you'll remember Yul Brenner and McKee and I in the movie, and also he was on Broadway, I think, for years, if not months, uh, doing the King and I. And uh, in one one uh, voice coach, who at that time she uh, Dorothy Stratton, she was a well-known Broadway actress. She later became a speech uh, expert, but. Uh, she said before he went on uh, stage, Yul Brenner would, um, he'd ask people to leave him alone for five minutes and he'd go to the nearest wall and push against the wall like, and grunt as hard as he could, rrr, rrr, you know, like a football player. Well, he, uh, that relaxed him because he'd have to dance and sing in the King and I, but she said it seemed, it's, this calm seemed to come over him when he did this. I tried this in high school, but it was, uh, I played high school football and the wall was the other team and oftentimes the wall would push me back. So that didn't work out so well, but. <laughs> And here's the last thing, Percy Hatfield, whom I worked with for 30 years at CBC, and then he later was a city councilor, and he's just wrapping up his career as an MPP in Windsor Tecumseh. He's going to retire when the election comes in June. He used to do something that you may recoil from, you may not uh, agree with this, but he used Vaseline and he would put a dab of Vaseline under his lower uh, top lip, top lip <laughs> and he'd rub it on over his teeth and over his lower teeth. And that would prevent him from getting dry mouth during a live program. He used to have Percy's panel. He used to do speeches all the time too, but that was his trick now. Uh, if you look up the ingredients of Vaseline, it's not to be taken internally, but you can also buy biotin in the uh, dental section to help loosen up your, your uh, you know, to keep your mouth uh, moist and uh, not having a, a dry mouth. So, so before I go to questions, I just want to give you, a, like, repeat a couple of other things. Uh, the books I used, uh, there are a few books I'd recommend. They're all available on Amazon. I got a couple here. 
and I mentioned uh, T.J. Walker. He's an expert. He's done thousands. Uh, can you see that? He's done thousands of, uh, it probably looks backwards on camera, but uh, I've got two or three of his books. Plus he does uh, online courses. And uh, he, um, He's just an expert. He's a former anchorman. I saw him on 60 Minutes about, I don't know, about 12 years ago teaching CEOs and celebrities. If you go to his studio in New York City, which I haven't because I can't afford $1,000 an hour or whatever it is, he'll have a bunch of camera people uh, teaching you how to do scrums and and how to speak. He uh, you know, he's taught prime ministers, presidents, uh, CEOs, helped them to prepare for different speeches and things like that. So he's a true professional. He has uh, online, you can, uh, if you Google his name, TJ Walker, you can go online and uh, he can give you all sorts of, uh, all sorts of um, tips many of the tips I've stolen for this tonight. And the other book is called Never Be Nervous Again by Dorothy Sarnoff. I mentioned her. Uh, she's also available on on Amazon. And she she left, she died in 2008, but uh, she she left a number of books that are still available. And they're really helpful. They're not junk like the professional books I thought I had bought and they'll be donated to Goodwill this week. And the last the last suggestion I'd make is uh, if you can go to uh, Toastmasters. Toastmasters has, there are at least, I, I know of two Toastmasters uh, groups in Windsor, uh, one in Windsor, one in LaSalle. And you can Google them they're all over North America and perhaps the world, as far as you know. If you remember Herb Gray when he was Windsor West MP, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, he was a big uh, supporter of Toastmasters. That's how, when he was a young lawyer back in the 60s, he, he joined Toastmasters. Uh, and they teach you everything from talking to small groups talking to just people at your table at an event to you know large formal speeches things like that it's another place where you can get practice lots of practice and you can become more comfortable with this uh so before before i ask for questions if anybody has any questions uh i just want to promote that uh this is an ongoing series not me but others will be on every Wednesday night, I think, uh, promoting uh, Windsor Center for Film and Digital Media. And, uh, you know, these courses, we hope we're now renovating the former uh, downtown mission, and we hope very soon we'll be able to do these types of courses live for all ages, give back. Uh, to doing live teaching of, uh, you know, there's the uh, film camp for kids, for kids seven to 17. And, uh, you know, we've expanded to all ages and uh, uh, there'll be more about that in the coming days. So if you've got any questions, I'll take your questions now. 